Hi, and welcome to another Coral Masterclass. Today, I want to speak about modernity and choral music. I want to speak about uh, the Eucharist and the music for the Eucharist. I want to speak about modality and modal scales versus tonality and tonal scales. And I want to speak about a composer that is probably in need to be rediscovered. If you want to know more, please stay tuned. In modern times, the society at large is telling us that modern is always good. So more a thing is modern and much better is uh, re respect what came before. But is this true or maybe not really? I think there is a wrong thinking uh, concerning music. Uh, the wrong thinking is that uh, all that is modern is better that, than what was in the past. I mean, this is really garbage. So it means that we have to consider a, bet, uh, a best composer, I don't know, Stockhausen, uh, comparing with Bach or uh, Nono, Luigi Nono, comparing with Mozart. I, I mean, this is really not uh, a logical reasoning. Of course, uh, there are modern composers that uh, may be very good, uh, even excellent, uh, even genius, but uh, um, the idea of progress is not that uh, what is new is better of what was before. And there is no new good things if they are not built on tradition. And also that's not only the problem. The problem is when music is no more a way to connect people, is a way to engage people, is a way to transmit something that uh, uh, belongs to people but also forms society and become some sort of uh, Gnostic knowledge, some, uh, some elitist uh, uh, kind of um, repertoire. Uh, when this is happening, we are really on the right track. I think that every one of you may doubt about this. So we have to admit that some modern music, contemporary or avant-garde, is no more able to communicate, to engage, to disseminate, to enlighten, to transmit, but this instead alienating, disaffecting people estranging them from music, separating them from what belongs to them, turning them off. So we can ask if what the thinker, French thinker Antoine Campagnon said in his book The Five Paradoxes of Modernity is not true. What are these five paradoxes? The first one is the superstition of the new, the second the religion of the future, the third the mania for theory, the fourth, the appeal to mass culture, and the fifth, the passion for repudiation. But so, be modern means that you have to disregard the people? I don't think so. And also Domenico Bartolucci and others like him don't think in this way. Uh, Domenico Bartolucci thought that being modern still means that you need to communicate with people and especially when you are doing sacred music. What is the purpose, uh, the purpose of sacred music? Is the glorification of God and the sanctification of the faithful. So you need also to find a way certainly to use all the um, uh, means that technique offer you but never disregarding those that are uh, the receiver of your music. Certainly, the first that uh, is uh, uh, the receiver of music is God, because the, the music, sacred music, is for the glory of God. But also need to be able to communicate with the faithful, communicate that beauty that has its first source in God himself. Domenico Bartolucci was born in May 7, 1917, in Borgo San Lorenzo, a little village close to Florence. 
His parents were farmers. In his village, musical life was really alive. He told me in an interview. My father was a workman, but he sang continually in the vegetable garden. Also mom, she sang in church, but she was not a singer. But you see, you went to the village and can hear the shopkeeper singing. It was a life simpler, more authentic and more beautiful, in fact. Since very young age, he shown a double vocation for the Catholic priesthood and for music. When entering the seminary, he can, of course, study all the necessary disciplines to become a good Catholic priest, but also he can deepen his knowledge about music thanks to his teacher, Francesco Bagnoli, and he will always mention him to us students as a great influence in his musical life. He was appointed in very important position in church music, the most important being to be the choir director of the Sistine Chapel Choir, the choir of the Pope, a position he will have for more than 40 years. After his retirement, he would continue to compose and conduct. Pope Benedict XVI will make him a cardinal as an award for his great contribution to the music of the Catholic Church. He died in 2013 at the age of 96 and he left his enormous musical heritage represented by his compositions. Among the most famous pieces is O Sacrum Convivium, a delicate motet in honor of the Eucharist. The text for this piece is taken from the antiphon at the Vespers of the Corpus Domini, a text that is ascribed to the work of St. Thomas Aquinas. Now let us talk about uh, the melody of chant and uh, the melodic material of uh, the Osacron Convivium by Domenico Bartolucci. How the composer borrowed the material from chant uh, to his own piece. Uh, in a certain way the process was similar to the one used by Renaissance composer. So they will take melodies, but uh, they will uh, not include all the notes. They will uh, uh, remove uh, some notes that are not considered essential to the structure of the melody. Uh, I remember uh, Maestro Bartolucci, when he has had class with us, uh, he said that uh, the composer removed what he called the male note. Male note means the bad notes. Uh, of course, it has not to be taken bad in a uh, uh, literal sense. Bad means not essential. Male note, the, the not essential notes. Uh, so in this regard, the, the process was very similar uh, to the one of uh, Renaissance composer. But what is uh, different uh, in all the compositions of Bartolucci, especially when he borrowed material from Gregorian chant, is that uh, he tried to uh, preserve the flow of the chant melody even in the rhythmic sense. Uh, uh, while the Renaissance composer, they will take the melody and they will, uh, you know, put in motion a certain kind of rhythm. Uh, so the, the first note will be longer, uh, maybe four uh, 
the bit and then the other two two bit and then it, it will go uh, the rhythm uh, uh, faster and faster uh, so this was quite standardized in Renaissance polyphony, but uh, what uh, Bartolucci has tried to do, and he succeeded really well, is that he tried to preserve the flow of the original chant melody, even if sometimes, uh, like in this piece, uh, the, the movement would be slower because the piece is a very meditative piece, uh, but uh, this kind of uh, idea about uh, preserving the rhythm of the chant melody is really uh, original to his own way of composing music and uh, is really something that makes his music uh, uh, really uh, fresh and alive. We should talk about the, the setting of this piece. So, uh, as I mentioned, it's a piece in four parts. Now. I have to uh, r refer something that uh, I remember. Um, in the mm, manuscripts of uh, uh, Monsignor Bal Bartolucci that I have the occasion to, to review and, uh, and to see, uh, I remember that uh, there was one with a very early version of this piece for uh, uh, treble, voice, and uh, organ. So it may be possible that the piece was written originally as a piece for unison and organ, as it is possible that uh, uh, is the opposite, that uh, uh, this uh, version that I saw on uh, paper was uh, a later arrangement. But it would be not uh, strange that uh, uh, the piece started as a uh, a unison with organ because also other pieces uh, from Maestro Bartolucci started in this way. Uh, for example, I remember always he uh, told me about the story of uh, uh, his most uh, famous piece in the United States that is uh, Christus Est. Uh, maybe uh, the American will not recognize this, na this name but uh, uh, they will soon when I will explain. Um, this piece uh, was born as a Christmas carol, is, if I'm not uh, mistaken, in Italian, uh, for uh, voice and organ. He, he told me he, he write this, uh, this in on the train. Then he transformed this piece in a six parts piece called Christus Est, the one a really beautiful Christmas piece. Um, in the uh, United States, uh, they noticed this piece, probably they uh, hear the piece in one of the broadcasting of the Christmas, Christmas Mass from the Vatican. And so uh, they, uh, the singer Perry Como take uh, the, the piece and ask Ray Charles to write a text for uh, the new English version uh, of the piece. And, the, and this piece was a big success uh, called Christ is Born, and uh, Maestro Bartolucci always mentioned that this was his most uh, profitable piece, uh, the, 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 the piece uh, that gave him uh, more uh, uh, royalties. So, um, regardless uh, what was the, uh, the first version, uh, we have in any way uh, two kind of uh, settings of this piece very similar. One is the one that we will use for the uh, for the music example is the one for SATB, but uh, in the Sistri Chapel he was used to perform the other one uh, that is we may say CTTB, uh, where the alto part as was for Renaissance choirs is sung by a uh, high tenor. So we have in one case, SATB, uh, a setting of this piece for modern choir. Uh, so uh, with the alto that is a woman. And in the other case, we have the piece uh, in the, we say, Renaissance version. Uh, you know that there are some differences uh, between the, the way uh, Renaissance choir was arranged and the way a uh, modern choir is arranged. But uh, we will not go into this now. Just I want to mention that uh, the 
audio example that you will listen is referred to the we call it Renaissance version of the piece but indeed the differences uh, I sung both versions and the differences uh, are, are very little uh, it's just that in one version of course uh, uh, there are some arrangements because uh, the uh, alto part is not uh, uh, performed by a uh, woman but by uh, uh, a tenor a man how I would define the style of this piece um, this is an interesting question because it is indeed a short piece it's only two pages and uh, maybe two minutes long and um, it is not I would say a full-blown motet in the sense of having uh, imitations, uh, repeated imitations. Uh, the here the imitation are always in uh, answer to what the soprano part is singing. So in a normal uh, Renaissance polyphonic motet, uh, as you well know, all the voices basically are singing the the main melody. But in this one, uh, I would say that, uh, of course, the main melody is only with the soprano, but it's not a chorale in the sense that the other part are only doing a harmony. The other part are doing some counterpoint, uh, always answering what the soprano is doing. And this is done in a very skillful way. Uh, so uh, uh, perfect... Uh, control of uh, the composition technique allow the composer really to make this dialogue um, really elegant and delicate. One of the main features of the style of uh, Maestro Bartolucci is the use of, of modality. Um, of course most of the music that the people hear is a tonal music so it's based on the major and minor modes but uh, Maestro Bartolucci did a choice that was also in contrast what uh, with what the church music uh, world was uh, uh, experiencing in that time uh, as you may mention uh, you may remember I mentioned about uh, Lorenzo Berosi certainly one of the most famous and important church music composer and he was the predecessor of uh, uh, Maestro Bartolucci in the Sistine Chapel Choir. So for some time uh, uh, Maestro Bartolucci was the assistant of uh, Lorenzo Berosi in the Sistine Chapel Choir and in 1956, if I don't remember uh, incorrectly, uh, Perosi died and Maestro Bartolucci take his place uh, at the, uh, at the uh, direction uh, of the choir. Uh, so, but in, in the case of Lorenzo Berosi, even if uh, we mentioned before, he used also some modal colors in his pieces, but his uh, pieces were strongly based on the major minor tonality. Not in the case of uh, Cardinal Bartolucci, Maestro Bartolucci. He wrote uh, certainly also some tonal pieces, but most of his production is based on the uh, modal scales the scales that, that are also used in Gregorian chant and that are then used by Renaissance composers. Um, we don't enter too much into the topic of modality in this video because it's also a, a kind of blurry uh, topic. Uh, some scholars uh, uh, see modality only with the tonal eyes. I, I might remember, I may remember, for example, a Giulio Bass that was an Italian uh, scholar, composer, and uh, Gregorianist. And uh, when you speak about uh, modality, you can really see that the framework of uh, tonality is always there. Uh, so when he talk about the modes, uh, uh, he say, oh, so this is like F major, uh, C major, do so it's always looking to modality with the eyes of uh, tonality. A and so he uh, say, oh, tonality is more straightforward in a certain sense. You know, we know that there is this strong opposition between uh, 
tonic and dominant and dominant that want to return to tonic and everything you know is based on this kind of uh, uh, contrast uh, even if you know uh, one of the most famous uh, harmonized scale in Toland music you know that we call the rule of the octave you can see that everything is really tending to the uh, opposition between dominant and tonic uh, it, is, it is not the same in the case of modality uh, tonality is a more kind of vertical uh, conception while modality is more horizontal is more the melody that create the scale in a certain sense if we want to uh, be really essential of course uh, in, especially in the medieval times there were some systemization of uh, the modes but these were uh, you know some kind of uh, uh, tight dressing and so some chants uh, some chant are, are not really fitting well but um, we use this uh, modes and this name for uh, easy reference and uh, in the uh, uh, church uh, music uh, uh, in the we say european uh, we call it with a latin uh, or, or or latinized name uh, the the first and the second mode are called protus the third and the fourth are called deuterus the fifth and the sixth are called tritus and the seventh and the eighth are called tetrardus in the case of our piece the mode used is the mode of the chant melody that is uh, tritus um the that uh, the melody is in in the fifth tone so authentic tritus but uh, in the case of the polyphony uh scholar also like bernard Meyer mentioned that uh, there were there was not a real clear division between authentic and plagal mode so uh, uh we cannot say oh this is in authentic treatise or or, or plagal treatise we say is in treatise uh, of course there may be some technical differences and in the case of this mode um Th there is uh, certainly one uh, I important element that I think it would be worthy to mention. We may say that the scale of uh, uh, Tritus or Lydian is uh, similar to the one of uh, a F major but with a, an important difference uh, that I think uh, you can notice that uh, B is natural not flat. Uh, it's also true that sometimes because of the relationship between B and F uh, that uh, uh, we call uh, Triton, uh, the B uh, become flat because uh, you know that for the medieval uh, the Triton was to avoid at all cost. They call it the Diabolus in Musica, the devil in music. So it was something that really was to be uh, removed in any possible way. Giovanni Maria Lanfranco, uh, a theorist, music theorist from Renaissance time, in his Scintille di Musica, uh, published in 1533, mentioned that uh, when the melody is around the Do, uh, when we are in Tritus, so uh, usually the B is natural and when the melody is more in relationship with the F so uh, the B uh, become flat. Uh, indeed uh, we uh, can see also that uh, in the uh, piece of uh, Maestro Bartolucci o Sacrum Convivium that is a, a treatise but uh, transposed in G in the version for SATB so the version of a modern choir uh, the 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 fourth uh, note so uh, in this case do c uh, has always a kind of uh, flexible uh, movement a flexible uh, uh, relationship between the natural and the flat also if we can talk about three details very fast the third degree of the scale is always uh, in the, we may say 5-3 uh, 
and not in the uh, uh, first inversion of the chord and also as I mentioned the uh, the dominant is, is, is always uh, more blurry and ambiguous than in in tonal scales uh, it's really uh, important to avoid this strong dominant tonic relationship and this is also true for the final uh, cadence uh, the cadence used is uh, throughout the piece is mostly the uh, plagal cadence and, and not the cadence uh, dominant tonic. This uh, really give a very uh, great flavor of uh, modality and not uh, this kind of flavor as, um, as a, um, a tonal piece. Uh, so these three characteristics that uh, I mentioned now uh, very fast, uh, almost in passing, we can find it throughout uh, the whole piece. Thank you for watching this video i hope you like it and so please click like and uh, please subscribe to our channel more videos to come so as always stay tuned